started writing Food for the Archons as a book of despair after watching my father die in 2013. During his transition, I experienced a series of paranormal and psychic events that left me feeling that I had either gone completely crazy or fell into humanity's darkest secret. I spent the next five years conducting extensive research, and I quickly learned that what I had experienced was real. My journey brought me to an understanding that showed me that despite the terrifying reality of an unseen predator, we as humans have a forgotten power. Just knowing this brings us tremendous hope in what once seemed a dark reality. I wrote this book for me in hopes of gaining a better understanding of our reality and relationship to it, but my hope is that you will find as much value in reading it as I did in writing it. I am human, food for the Archons, humanity's psychic connections, simulated realities, parallel worlds, and the manipulation of mankind. It's available on Amazon.com and at SixthSenseMedia.net and wherever books are sold. I'm Dennis Nappy II, reminding you to let your intuition be your guide. Thank you. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. But there's something wrong in the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. What is this reality? As truth seekers were plagued by this question and evidence of what we think may be the truth as we search for knowledge trying to understand this existence and really trying to understand who we are. We start to see signs and symbols in our dreams, in our waking reality, in the movies we watch. We see it in the packaging labels on the food we purchase, the logos on clothing that we wear, little symbols, little hints, little clues all around us. Is it just in our head? Do we have an overactive imagination? Or is there some form of communication coming from somewhere else? What is that somewhere else? What is the purpose of that communication? It's a dizzying thought process. It's a dizzying experience to go through. It would be easier to just shut it down, walk away, and just go get drunk. But for most of us out there, we can't stop. Because this question, as they say in the Matrix, it's the question that drives us. We know that question well. I'm going to, I'm going to explore that question. I'm going to explore that attempt to understand reality quite deeply on this episode. Hello, Truth Seekers. Dennis Nappy II with Sixth Sense Media. This is another episode of The Seeker Podcast where... We aim to make the paranormal feel quite normal and the supernatural quite natural. And I think that's what's going to happen once again on this episode of The Seeker Podcast. Lots of interesting things going on around us. I've got a few news stories. Uh, the big one that I'll get to in a moment, Matrix 4, has been confirmed. What a powerful film that is. I'm trying to uh, contain my excitement. I'm trying not to let that subject alone dominate the entire conversation. Two stories I want to share in the news before I kind of freestyle into what I want to talk about. But of course, quick commercial here. If you haven't done so already, what am I going to say here? Food for the Archons. I am human food for the Archons. Humanity's psychic connection, simulated realities, parallel worlds, and the manipulation of mankind is out. Available on Amazon. You can find it at sixcentsmedia.net as well. I highly encourage you to check it out. It's, uh, it's getting some great feedback on this book. If you enjoy the show, you will enjoy this book. I think you'll find a lot of dots, connected pieces to the puzzle, understanding this reality. We are human, or are we? We are psychic. Our reality is not what we think it is. And we're being fed upon due to our ignorance of our psychic connection. All right, commercial over. Interesting story here. This comes to us from The Sun. The U.S. Navy wants to build a fleet of 10 robot warships over the next five years. The huge ships referred to as Large Unmanned Surface Vehicle, LUSV, would function as scouts for the main battle fleet. 
carrying radar and sonar, as well as anti-air and cruise missiles. Proponents of the ship see the role of the vessels as carrying out 3D work, dull, dirty, and dangerous. A draft requested for proposal posted on the FedBiz Ops website said the LUSV will be a high-endurance reconfigurable ship able to accommodate various payloads for unmanned missions to augment the Navy's manned surface force. We've got robot warships coming out, my friends. That's what they're in the process of planning, at least publicly planning. Chances are they already have these things out there um, anyway. But what does that tell us? Let's put the doom and gloom hat on. Here comes Skynet. When the military is developing drones for the purposes of war, that is Skynet. Interesting. Is that some predictive programming that we've been seeing here? Uh, I'm going to hold that thought. I'll come back to that. This one, I, I found this through Fox News. Apple iPhone 7 radiation test prompts FCC investigation report. Apple's popular iPhone 7 produced radio frequency radiation above the legal limit in a new test prompting the Federal Communications Commission to investigate the issue. The cell phone was set to operate at full power and was secured below a tub of clear liquid formulated to mimic human tissue during the test, which was conducted and paid for by the Chicago Tribune inside an accredited lab following federal guidelines. For 18 minutes, a tiny probe measured the radio frequency radiation the liquid was absorbing from the iPhone 7. According to the Tribune, the test found radio frequency radiation, quote, over the legal safety limit and more than double what Apple reported to federal regulators from its own testing. The newspaper tested three more brand new iPhone 7s at full power, and those also measured above the exposure limit. In total, 11 models from four different manufacturers were tested. The FCC told the Tribune it would conduct its own testing over the next few months. We take seriously any claims on non-compliance with the RF radio frequency exposure standards and will be obtaining and testing the subject phones for compliance with FCC rules. Agency spokesman Neil Grace said, as the Tribune notes, it's not clear whether prolonged exposure to free radio frequency radiation can increase the risk of cancers or cause harm. With cell phones in wide use around the world, the issue is sure to receive increased scrutiny. Two phone manufacturers, including Apple, dispute the Tribune's results, saying the lab that the newspaper used does not conduct tests the same way the tech giant does, although the company did not specify exactly what was different or wrong about the Tribune's test. All right, so uh, there's a little bit more left in this article. Okay, so what if they don't test the phone in the same way? They got results that say the radiation is too high. Do we have a problem? Well, most of you listening to this show, I would assume, would say, yes, there's probably an issue with this going on here. Now, here is my frustration. I've had some arguments with people. I am by no means an expert. Reading a report like this, again, this is what you would call level one. You get this data here, and if you're going to jump the gun and freak out, well, shame on you, you need to start digging further. Now, I've, I've looked into the cell phone radiation previously. Again, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to try to quote you facts and data, and I didn't pull them because that's not what this episode's about. But at the bare minimum, there is a study that seems to be credible from a credible lab that's accredited by the FCC, that's saying this is dangerous. Yet I guarantee if you go talk to somebody and say, yo, I'd keep that cell phone away from your head, it, it has dangerous levels of radiation above the acceptable limits. Apple may have misrepresented the facts or there may be an error or there is a discrepancy. People are going to get frustrated with you. People are going to get upset. It's, and it's the same thing with the vaccine stuff. There are some issues here with the overall intentions and goals and credibility of the people behind these things. Big companies and governments have a history of lying, deceiving the public, and experimenting on people. But the instant you find something, people don't want to hear about it. And then you're stuck with this moral dilemma. You say, well, I found this information I feel, and this isn't about waking people up. This is, I found this information. I'm concerned about it. What do you think? And people are getting mad. People are getting mad at you when you start to try to say, it's like, but I, I really am coming to you from a place of care and concern. But people don't want to hear it because, well, we have a fake news pandemic, which is a great way to mask stuff like this. Well, it's just more fake news. 
easy way to dismiss something because it sounds incredible. It sounds fantastic. It must be fake news. So something to be mindful. But for those of you who are open-minded enough to look at this type of information, again, this is just 4G. Let's start doing our homework if we haven't already on 5G technology because I suspect it's going to be a lot more concerning than just this. And and that's a, that's a whole different show. We're not going to do that right now. Let's move on to the big story. Now, the Matrix movie. I didn't realize at the time that I first saw this movie what it did to me. How that movie changed me. I, I don't even want to say changed me. Awakened something in me. And, and I... I don't like to use the term woke or awakened because I do feel that it denotes uh, in, in the way, the context in which it's used, I feel that it denotes, well, I've got special knowledge and you don't. I'm awake and you're asleep. And, and I really don't, I don't mean it that way. I just mean it opened me up to a possibility of something else in this reality. And, and with that, let me give this caveat. I had a discussion on Facebook over people's frustrations, people that are on this a similar path to this, and they find themselves frustrated because so many other people, quote, aren't awake. But the reality is, it's not our job to wake anybody up. It's not our job to force people onto this path because we still don't understand this reality. For all we know, people who are, quote, not awake may be serving a very important purpose. Now, from our perspective, we could look at it and say, well, our goals or reality could get better or our goals could be better met if these people just had this knowledge. If these people were just awake and understood things, life would get so much better. And that is how it seems. But what is this reality? What is the purpose of this existence? We can only speculate right now. Even people who have been given that divine glimpse of what may be out there, you're getting a small fraction. We don't know for sure. We don't know if that glimpse is another projection is another form of manipulation within this reality. A lot of rabbit holes to go down. Let me let me share this big news about the Matrix, though. I got this from Variety.com. Matrix 4 officially a go with Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, and Lena Wachowski. Exclusive. exclusive. Get ready to re-enter the Matrix. Lena Wachowski is set to write and direct a fourth film set in the world of the Matrix, with Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moth, rep- reprising their roles as Neo and Trinity, Trinity, respectively. Warner Brothers Pictures and Village Roadshow Pictures will produce and globally distribute the film. Warner Brothers Picture Group Chairman Toby Emmerich made the announcement on Tuesday. We could not be more excited to be re-entering the Matrix with Lena, said Emmerich. Lena is a true visionary, a single and original creative filmmaker, and we are thrilled that she is writing, directing, and producing this new chapter in the Matrix universe. In addition to Wachowski, the script was also written by uh, Alexander Hemon and David Mitchell. Wachowski is also producing with Grant Hill. Sources say the film is eyed to begin production at the top of 2020. Uh, I will share the rest of this so you can read the article. It'll be in the show notes at sixcentsmedia.net. It'll be in the Seeker newsletter as well. This is huge news. Now, I've read a lot of articles out there speculating What's going to, how's this going to play out? How is Neo, who we assumed was dead, um, how's he going to make an appearance in this? How is Trinity going to star in this movie uh, if she's dead as of the last Matrix movie? Well, again, what is reality? There's fan theories out there talking about when Neo wakes up in the Matrix in the end of the second one. He sees the sentinels coming towards him and he says, I can feel them. And he puts his hand up and he takes the sentinels down. Some people say because of that, Neo 
actually woke up in another level of the matrix. So that whole piece in Zion was actually still a level deep of the matrix. Now that would make sense. That would be a very smart way to do things. Now, when you look at, uh, well, well I, I covered it extensively in my book. I, I have a, a matrix, several matrix and AI chapters. It sounds like reality could be levels upon levels upon levels upon levels multiple and that's why the title of my of my book is simulated realities parallel worlds and the manipulation of mankind i wanted to put that subtitle in there because there's a lot of good theories out there a lot of thought exercises out there and i'd say witness testimony that this reality may be several layers deep. And if you think of the movie, the movie Inception, I think that paints a, a good way of understanding how we may be existing within a dream, within a dream, within a dream, within a dream. And I've got multiple sources exploring this in Food for the Archons. I'm going to read from one um, right now, actually. So I pulled from... I pulled from the Nag Hammadi Library, and I was looking at the book of Zostrianos. Now, Zostrianos, I, I look at him as he was one of the first, at least recorded, truth seekers. And he was so frustrated, so frustrated with trying to get information in reality. He's like, forget it. I'm going to end my life. I'm done. And he was getting ready to kill himself. And then the angel of knowledge appears to him and takes him on this journey. Um, so... I'm going to read part of what I wrote here. As Ostranos makes his journey through various aspects of reality, we find that he continued his journey with the Angel of Knowledge through what is referred to as the atmospheric realm, described as the Earth and seven planets, Moon, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Zostrianos then encountered what is referred to as the self-generated aeons as he seeks the single reality underlying the self-generated aeons. That's a quote. Zostrianos is searching for the base reality, the pleroma or divine fullness as he's trying to understand this existence. Now, again, an aeon exists as a conscious entity, but also as a, like an AI or a virtual reality system. That's my aside note right there. I explained earlier in the book, back to the book, the self-generated aeons offer to teach Zostrianos about the origins of physical reality and Sophia's role. They explain that the physical universe was envisioned by Sophia. And then through her influence, creation created by the archon of creation they then go on to teach zostrianos about the aeonic copies which act to quote serve as a pattern by which incarnate souls are enabled to think that they see the ideal reality that truly exists thus giving them an initial orientation towards intelligible reality enabling them to be transferred from the mere visible copies of heavenly realities to their archetypal patterns contained in the true truly existent sojourn repentance and self-generated aeons, end quote. I had to read, as I was writing this book, I must have read that paragraph that I quoted in here 50 to 100 times to try to understand that. I'm going to read it again. The, the aeonic copies, now that term in and of itself, a copy of an aeon. If an aeon acts as a reality, a copy of a reality is another universe. It is a virtual reality. Okay. Understand this was, this document was recovered over 1400 years ago and was written even before that. How the heck did people from that far back have an understanding of virtual reality? Think about that for a minute. Think about it. The mere fact that this is almost 2,000 years old and people were writing about it then, what does that tell us about our current reality now? I think this is a smoking gun and it's exciting and it's enlightening. So let's read this again. Ayana copies act to serve as a pattern by which incarnate souls are able to think that they see the ideal reality that truly exists. So the soul in the aeonic copy thinks that it's in base reality. They think that this is real. 
thus giving them an initial orientation towards intelligible reality, enabling them to be transferred from the mere visible copies of heavenly realities to the archetypal patterns contained in the truly existent sojourn, repentance, and self-generated aeons. So basically, and as you re- if you read the book of Zostradamus, and if you read about aeonic copies, the soul that's in the copy thinks that it's in the real reality until it achieves the light of truth that it's looking for, or that it needs to, not that it's looking for, because it doesn't know what it's looking for, it doesn't know that it's, that it's there. But it's in that reality that it thinks is the real reality, which that is a copy of the actual reality, until it acquires the specific knowledge that it needs, and then it joins with the base reality again. So let's say you your soul needs to learn something. Something happens, your soul needs to learn something. And a sp- I, I go into this in, so deep in the book. I, I hope you read it. But your soul or your consciousness will split. So you're going to go on in your base reality. La, da, 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 life is normal. You have no understanding that your consciousness has split. This piece of you that has fragmented off thinks that it is the, the real thing. It's like you've been cloned and aren't aware that you've been cloned because everything seems the same. And it goes out and it learns that lesson in base reality. And then, now this is me speculating, once that lesson is learned, that base reality completely dissolves. That copy re-merges with the base consciousness. That copy is no longer aware of itself. It now becomes part of the whole again. And what do you get? A download of information. Is that possible? Is that where our downloads come from? Then that means these downloads are not coming from something else. They are coming from us. But then we have the aeon that we may be experiencing reality within. Well, what is the aeon? Is it us? Is it something else? Are we a part of it? It raises more questions. Now, I want to look at Rene Descartes, the famous line, I think, therefore I am. I'm going to read a quote, an excerpt surrounding I think, therefore I am. Now, this is written by Descartes, uh, I want to say, in, it looks like 1663. As I then desired to give my attention solely to the search after truth, I thought I ought to reject as absolutely false all options in regard to which I could suppose the least ground for doubt, in order to ascertain whether after that there remained anything at all in my belief that was wholly indubitable. Accordingly, seeing that our senses sometimes deceive us, I was willing to suppose that there existed nothing really such as they presented to us. The very same thoughts or presentations which we experience when awake may also be experienced when we are asleep, while there is at at that time not one of them true. I suppose that all the objects, presentations that had ever entered into my mind when awake had in them no more truth than the illusions of my dreams. But immediately upon this I observed that whilst I... Thus wished to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I, who thus thought, should be somewhat. And as I observed that this truth I think, therefore I am, cogito erum sum, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt, however extravagant, could be alleged by the skeptics capable of shaking it, I concluded that I might without scruple accepted as the first principle of the philosophy of which I was in search. I thence concluded that I was a substance whose whole essence of nature consists only in thinking, and which, that in my exist, has need of no place, nor is dependent on any material thing, so that I, that is to say, the mind by which I, I am, is wholly distinct from the body, and is even more easily known than the latter. So what Descartes is saying is the difference between my dreaming reality and my waking reality is indiscernible because I'm deceived when I'm dreaming, I'm deceived when I'm awake, I can't tell the difference. When I'm, a, when I'm dreaming, I can't tell that I'm dreaming, when I'm awake, how do I prove that I'm not dreaming? 
The only thing that I can prove is that because I am thinking, I must exist. I think, therefore I am. I am consciousness is what he's saying. And that's all that I can prove is that I am consciousness. And you can't argue that I think, therefore I am. So looking at Descartes, he's looking at the dream world. Could the dream world be another existence, another aeon, an aeonic copy of this reality that we sometimes go into? That sounds a little bit crazy, right? Well, maybe. But then you look at, and I've, I've mentioned this in other shows, Whitley Strieber has a, a, one of his books called The Secret School, where when he would sleep, he'd be taken and taken to a different school where he'd be given es esoteric knowledge. Bob Monroe experienced in one of his out-of-body travels, Sleeper School, where he found thousands of people seated like in, in this dreamlike state. Now, Monroe's out-of-body in what was called by the consciousness he encountered, Sleeper School, where people would go and they looks like they were having information placed into their minds. So we're seeing, we, there is witness testimony, experiential evidence of other realities, other aeons that give us information that seem like the base reality when we're there and then we're sucked back into our normal consciousness and merge back with this consciousness in this physical body. What is our reality? I don't know. And I wonder how much of this reality is driven by us, the creation of it. We really don't know. We often think the world is happening around us and we just need to as, as I've said, learn to ride the wave of change instead of fighting the change that's going on. But how much of this is actually created for us? Can we look beyond the, the scary stuff? Because there's some scary stuff there. Maybe that scary stuff is being created by us on some level. If you go back and listen to my discussion with Edward Reardon on Remote Viewing Pi, and what he found when he went deep enough, the mind he found, the aspect of himself that he found, it lends credibility to what we're exploring here that maybe this reality is on some level created by us. I know it's a tough thing to, to ponder. Let me step back. And I want to talk about synchronicities. And this is weird because when I was when I was in the military, when I was deployed, I um I was starting to get interested in out of body travel and and psychic abilities, but it, I was very closeted at that point. I was like, well, I'm, I'm in the military. Uh, I have a security clearance. I don't want people labeling me as a whack job and at that point i was just afraid to come out i don't know why but so i kept a journal that i snuck overseas with me so i could keep taking notes and keep rereading things that i wrote down that i thought were important to me spiritually while i was deployed so i was open to this information and while i was while i was there around christmas time now i was i was all business when i was over there and we did a secret Santa. And I remember the gift that I got. I remember it very clearly because I still have it. Somebody gave me the gift Monsters, Inc. And I remember opening this gift and thinking, this is ridiculous. I don't have any children. I don't think this is funny. Why would I have any interest in a kid's movie? Now, to this day, I still don't know who gave me this movie. I have no idea where this movie came from. Let me explain the premise of it if you haven't seen it. First of all, one of the main characters is this round little green goblin with one giant eye. The symbol for Monsters, Inc. is one giant eye, the all-seeing eye. And you see it quite frequently throughout the movie. Now, what's the premise of this movie? These monsters, their job, they work in a factory. 
their job is to open up another dimension, go through a door, enter through the closets into the human world where they go into a child's bedroom and scare that child while the child is sleeping. They then use technology to extract, the, they say, the screams of the child, the fear that that child feels. That fear is put in canisters. The fear in those canisters is used as energy to power their city. They use human fear to power their city. Now you could say, Dennis, maybe that's where food for the Archons came from. That seed was planted so many years ago and it's just, maybe. Or maybe somebody behind that movie knows something. Energy parasites. They scare the kids. They take the fear. They feed off of it. It's a central source of energy. Now this was almost 20 years ago. I had no clue about Archons, energy parasites, any of that stuff. And there it was. Why was I given that movie? Things happen in our lives. Synchronistic events that at the time don't seem important at all. And years later, we find, oh my gosh, that was so essential for my journey. At the same time, while I was overseas, I walked into, I don't know if it was a USO facility, somewhere on base, and they had free books for soldiers. And it was a, it was a whole rack of them. And I found this book, and, and I have talked about this before. Um, I'm, I'm Googling it right now, just so I can get the, get the author. The book was called Ventus. Um, sorry, now there's a fictional character named Ventus, so... <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, Ventus. This book was written by Carl Schrodinger. Schroeder. I'm sorry, Carl Schroeder. I read this book. I was enthralled by this book. This book is about a young man who lives in which seems like almost a medieval society, a very primitive society. And he encounters a woman who ultimately comes from space, who is highly advanced with technology. Now, they have on his planet flora, fauna, and what they call mecha. Mecha is machine life, autonomous life that runs on its own. It's very dangerous to people if you get caught with you know, if the Mecca finds you when you're out, because the Mecca, it seems like maybe there was previously an advanced society, and then something horrible happened, the Mecca survived, people went primitive again, and had no memory or understanding of where Mecca came from. The homes that were still running autonomously, they referred to as the gods' houses, but there were no gods in those houses, because those people were long gone. What this young man goes on to find out later is that he has the ability to control the Mecca with his mind. He has the ability to reach out to a being he calls Ka. I'm sorry, an intelligence he calls Ka. It's a form, it's a, it's a, like a virtual assistant that exists that can go out and gather information for him. It can go anywhere on his planet and find things and people and objects and get him downloads of information. Whenever he calls to it, it comes to him and it gives him information because he has Mecca in his head. Now, that book was... It gave me the ability to understand so much of what I talk about on this show. I read this book over 20 years ago. Fast forward again to my conversation with Edward Reardon, the remote viewer, and our one of our most popular shows, Remote Viewing QAnon, where the information that came out of that discussion was, ultimately, there's 
technology, nanotechnology that is being dispersed that will somehow interact with people's minds and there will be some kind of wave that goes out and changes the way people interact with the world. We, we analyze it and looked at that. Well, maybe there's going to be some kind of, when 5G comes online, it's going to suck people's minds into the matrix. But look how similar that is to that book. Why did I randomly select that book? Why did I get Monsters, Inc.? as a present I, I i don't i don't have an answer i don't you know it, it just it makes you wonder doesn't it and i'm sure all of you out there now can go back and find little moments like that where you've had a synchronistic event where powerful knowledge was given to you and at the time you didn't recognize it. And then years later, you, you realize I had to get that at that point in time to allow that to assimilate into my mind to put me into the position that I'm in right now. Now, maybe I'm just nuts because a lot of my foundation has come from works of fiction or maybe works of fiction creating into the untapped creative centers of ourselves gives us a access to those levels of consciousness that are closer to truth than we realize why did the matrix have such a big impact on me i i think it because it resonates with something so truthful and we see evidence of it now and, and again it's it's not a shameless plug but I was amazed at source after source after source I found while writing this book that I could put in there to compile this understanding of what is this reality. And I'm not, again, I'm not the first person, the only person to ever come to a conclusion like this. The Smashing Pumpkins. They have a song called Bullet with Butterfly Wings. I'm going to read you the introduction of that song. The introduction goes, The world is a vampire, sent to drain. Secret destroyers hold you up to the flames. And what do I get for my pain? Betrayed desires and a piece of the game. When I was in high school, I was at a party one night. It was New Year's Eve. And my friend hated this song. My other friends thought it was funny to continually play this song. But they didn't play the whole song. So for about an hour straight, all I heard was Billy Corgan saying, The world is a vampire. And then they'd, it was a CD, so they hit the back button. The world is a vampire. And we'd laugh and laugh. The world is a... And my friend was just freaking out. He's getting so mad because we just kept playing it over. It was brainwashing over and over and over again. But we had a good laugh. I never forgot that song. It wasn't until I started writing Food for the Archons, the song... I thought of the song. The world is a vampire. I said, let me look into this. And I went through... Despite all my rage, I am still just a rat in a cage. Then someone will say what is lost can never be saved. Despite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. That's the lyric, the, uh, the refrain, the chorus of that song. What was my fear? That we are prisoners on a farm being fed on. There's nothing we can do. I'm so mad about it. But we're just here on a loose farm as they're taking our energy as the Archons are feeding on us. Again, maybe this stuff just... Maybe this is why I have these crazy ideas. But my crazy ideas stemmed from someone else's crazy ideas. So I'm not the only one that had these thoughts that pieced these things together. Again, in terms of the reality stuff, go back to Zostrianos more than 1,400 years ago when that book was buried with the Nag Hammadi scriptures. And there's more. There's so much more. I'm not going to get into all of it tonight. I don't want to give the whole book away to you guys, but what does that mean about our reality? You know, uh, it was, I think I talked about it on the show a few months back. This I got so deep into this stuff, 
I had a good week where I wasn't sure if I had died. And I started going back thinking of moments in my life where I could have died, where my realities could have split. Because I thought, well, maybe when we die, we just merge into another reality and go on. We just branch off. And then the other reality is as if we didn't die. I don't know. But I had these crazy thoughts thinking of moments in my life where things happened where I could have died. And maybe I actually did die. I realized it was was this like crazy thought I had, but for a week I was really unsure. Am I dead and experiencing another reality right now? Challenge is, how can you tell? How can you find proof? How can you manipulate this reality to show it's different from another one? Well, you could enter the Milgram, uh, not the Milgram, the uh, Maharu... Too many M's. What's that thing called? The Mandela effect. So many M words. Maybe there you go. Maybe that's a sign right there. The Mandela effect, where people think that timelines are being changed and manipulated. So we're remembering things differently now. You know, the big one was Luke, I am your father. The big Star Wars one. But apparently the original line is, no, Luke, I am your father. But people just remember it as Darth Vader saying, Luke... I am your father. Which is it? I don't know. And there's several other ones that come out as well. But So what they're saying is that as the past is being changed, we're, we're holding on to both memories. Now, Philip K. Dick goes into a lot about deja vu. And basically what he says is when you have deja vu, you're exper- experiencing a split because somebody went into a certain point in time and changed that reality. And at that point of change, one reality goes on as if the change never happened and a new reality splits off and has created that other world, that other reality. And that's what deja vu is. It's that memory of that second reality being created. So is that what's happening? Are we experiencing multiple realities and things are changing constantly? Do we have that power? Is this existence like a choose-your-own-adventure book? Because I think about it and I see so many different opportunities presented to me all the time, every single day. And I look and I think, if I make this choice... It will totally change my life. Take me in this direction. If I make this choice, it will totally change my life and take me this in this direction. And I often have the thought, am I witnessing, are my predictions, not, not in a psychic sense, my, my analytical conclusions, am I seeing them coming true because I have chosen to go down this path with movies like Terminator and The Matrix, and then I start exploring AI and reality and consciousness. What we're seeing more and more evidence of that coming out now that I have started looking for it. Did I just simply make a choice? Am I in something like Total Recall right now? Is my body sitting somewhere in a store or, or a uh, an office where I said, hey, I want to have an experience just like Kane in the movie. I want to be a secret agent who deals with aliens on another planet. Well, I haven't been to another planet yet that I'm aware of, but uh, I, I, it's just, just too many parallels. So are these projections from within myself? I, I don't know. Maybe this is just the talk of something crazy. And if that's the case, well, then what does that say about who you are? Are you just another aspect of me? Am I just another aspect of you? Are you existing in your own reality, but somehow there's a means for us to communicate and interact? And my re- and you're hearing my voice because my reality is reaching out to your reality. Because on some level, we're one and the same. But we've branched into multiple points. I don't know. Okay. I feel like I'm just babbling on this show, my friends. I'm just kind of freestyling with some thoughts that I've been having. Um, And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it as we dissect this reality. Ultimately, I'm looking forward to the next Matrix movie 
And I'm wondering if there's going to be levels of predictive programming. Use caution when watching the movie, however. And be careful not to get trapped in dogma. And almost like a religious experience. As excited as I'm sure some of you are out there as I am. Hoping that there'll be a next level of answers and information hidden within the movie. Proceed with caution. Enjoy the film for the entertainment value, and let's hope that there are some new avenues to explore that will once again expand our minds. All right, my friends, my brain hurts. Maybe I'm merging too many realities right now, so I'm going to call it quits here. Um, but I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen. I want to give a couple plugs real quick. Uh, I, I gave a shout out to Edward Reardon, and I want to give a shout out to my crypto viewing team, my, uh, my my buddies over there. If you haven't done so already, please, please, please check it out. Cryptoviewing.com or patreon.com slash crypto viewing. The work that we're doing there is is important. Um if you want to understand where this reality, this perception of reality at least, is going, that's a great point to start. It gives you the foundation of what's going on with the financial system, but how that financial system affects all of our infrastructure and how that infrastructure is changing. And if you can understand that, I think you can put yourself in a better position to survive the change, to thrive during the change, as opposed to being somebody who gets caught confused or heavily manipulated by the system. So if you haven't done that, not only that, we're working with remote viewing every week. It's an, a, an amazing experiment to be a part of. And what we're learning about remote viewing, about our reality, about the future our ability to interact with that future through remote viewing for me has been so enlightening and you can be a part of that journey. So I highly encourage you to check it out. And again, if you're skeptical, you can look at Edward Reardon's work on, uh, on YouTube and you can look at Dick Allgaier's work um, as well. Dick does a lot of crypto viewing related stuff. Edward has his own remote viewing targets that he puts up on YouTube, but Dick's stuff is uh, heavily related to, the crypto viewing platform. It is the crypto viewing platform. It's the free content that he puts out and that should give you a better understanding of what we're doing on the team. There's a lot of good information on his on his free YouTube channel as well. So be sure to check it out. And as always, last but not least, I need to give a plug to uh, my good friend Ray Davis who's continuing to put out his affirmations and it's it's a nice break from this heavy stuff I tend to throw at you guys, and I encourage you to check it out. Um, he's got the affirmation spot on Facebook. He's got the affirmation spot on YouTube. He's starting to do some uh, affirmation vlogs as well. And, and Ray is just such a, a dose of positivity, but he's also so very wise. Um, his first book, Anunnaki Awakening, again, was a great way of using fiction to tell a story and teach you about the Anunnaki and that creation myth. Um, and he's working hard on book two. Ray, I'm waiting for it. I can't wait for that next book to come out. Um, so please check that out. You can find his links at sixcentsmedia.net. And lastly, once again, if you haven't done so, I'm Human Food for the Archons. Check it out. Amazon.com, sixcentsmedia.net slash archons. Have you read the book? I would love your feedback. More importantly, I would love for you to write a review on Amazon. That would really help others to find it. Using Amazon's algorithms, it would help promote the book as well. Uh, if you believe in this project and you've read the book, please write me a review. All right, friends, I'm out of time. This has been another episode of The Seeker Podcast, where small changes among the masses can have a massive impact around the world. I encourage you to be that change. Never stop questioning. Keep an open mind and let your intuition be your guide. Thanks for listening.